Hey, I'm Tara Telke. Um, welcome to the seventh installment of my art history series lecture. Um, my series this season is going to be um, called Art Through the Ages, and we're going to study um, ancient art forms from around the world. Um, our very first series is going to be about prehistoric art and parietal or cave art. So um, prehistoric art is the oldest art ever really discovered by humans, um, and it really comes before ancient art. Okay, and they are two separate categories. These are a number of examples from around the world. Now, the term prehistoric can be understood very easily if you break it down into its root words. So pre means before, his equals man, and store means story. So it's before man's story, or before man had developed written language. Um, so uh, on these tablets here, there's some examples of cuneiform, Sumerian, and Egyptian hieroglyphs, some of the, uh, some of the first languages um, ever discovered. Um, but these are actually fairly modern um, in comparison to all the art made before that, the prehistoric art. So we're studying stuff even before the written language. Um, we, I am gonna show you just a little segment of a video. Um, this is just a kind of a nice graphic of how uh, different languages, uh, where they began around the world and how they spread. We're not gonna watch the whole thing, but I'm gonna show just a little bit. So Sumerian was the very first language developed, and it was pictographs, images of the words that they were using. This region of the world is very much the cradle of this civilization, where uh, some of the first cultures developed lots of technologies. This is the Indus Valley. Another big civilization. Cuneiform was uh, suspected to be less of a language and a little bit more of a number writing system. Right, so we're going to stop that there. My classes can see that in person. But really nice graphic. Um, <clears throat> all right, so the very first kind of undisputed evidence of humans making um, artistic objects dates to what we call the Upper Paleolithic Era, or Late Stone Age. Um, whenever you think, hear things referred to like Stone Age, Bronze Age, uh, things like that, that's a European or a Eurocentric timeline. Um, and that's based on kind of the order in which Europeans uh, invented various technologies. So stone tools were the first things developed. Eventually, they learned to mani manipulate metals, which would be the Bronze Age and things like that. Um, this does not actually match the order in which other civilizations and cultures around the world invented objects. So again, it's kind of a Eurocentric um, timeline, um, but a more kind of broad term would be pa the Paleolithic era. Um, and there's evidence that there's works that are even maybe 60,000 years old now. Okay, now um, the early Stone Ages, um, which, you know, began over 200,000 years ago, which is even 150,000 years before we saw, we can confirm there's examples of art. Um, several species of um, hominids, which are homo sapiens, which are humans, Neanderthals, and a couple other hominid species um, were kind of existing at the same time in Africa and other parts of the world. Um, they were nomadic hunters and gatherers. Um, and m several of these hominid species could create tools. They could fashion arrowheads, spearheads, but basically they could chisel rocks into pointy shapes and create knives, hunting tools, and that sort of thing. And they also learned to control fire. So it wasn't just humans that learned to control fire, um, but Neanderthals, and I believe there were one or two other hominid species that were able to do that. Um, again, just gonna show just a little bit of a graphic. Um, this is a National Geographic uh, Human Origins 101. Great video um, that kind of just explains the evolution of early humans. Millions of years before industry, agriculture, and civilization, the world stage was set for one creature's unprecedented rise. The story of humanity's evolution began about seven million years ago when the human lineage broke away from that of chimpanzees. Over time, an ensemble cast of over 20 early human species, or hominids, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> have a cameo from my cat in the video. Okay, I'm going to stop the video there, but you can basically see that Homo sapiens, humans are very modern, um, you know, in that hominid development and haven't actually been a lot around that long, although they've had a huge impact on the earth and other creatures. So, <clears throat> um, the late Stone Age kind of um, marks the, er the era when human species expanded uh, beyond Africa. Okay, so again, this darker area right here, this kind of yellowish area, is sort of the cradle of civilization which is basically eastern, northeastern Africa and, and present-day present Saudi Arabia. Um, and these lines kind of show the, the way that um, human species started to expand and um, explore the world. So first into what we would call the Middle East and India and then up towards Europe, eventually maybe to, um, to Asia and also uh, Polynesian islands. Um, and then eventually, you know, the far east of Asia and then finally North America and South America. So actually the human species Native Americans um, in North and South America are actually you know, the most modern people, okay? So um, also what happened at this time is human beings started to develop settlements or campsites. Uh, they would also have storage pits. They were not farming yet, but they were starting to become a little bit less nomadic. They would have kind of safe places where they would store things and that they would return to regularly. Um, this, this period also is when um, different ethnicities began to develop. Um, and so as humans spread around the world um, and you know, acquired, arrived in different climates and habitats and things like that, um, they, would, they would evolve that way. Okay, so the next age is known as the Bronze Age. And again, this is kind of a Eurocentric timeline, um, but when um, you know, uh, Eurasian people had invented metal tools and learned to manipulate metal. This was another kind of major advance and advancement for humankind. Um, it was also the beginning of agriculture. So farming had occurred, also animal husbandry, which means um, that we were mating animals or we were keeping animals, such as keeping cows or some goats for their milk or keeping chickens for their eggs um, and things like that, uh, you know, for our own sustenance. Um, and then also symbols came into play here. So um, people were writing, drawing in the sense at least to create symbols, if nothing else. Um, and then also the development of a little bit more sophisticated art forms, okay? Now, the very first art forms um, were probably like jewelry and decorations that people could wear. Um, the earliest examples we have of this are beads or bones or seashell that have had holes drilled through them or sometimes little portable fig figurines um, and cave paintings. Um, so, uh, and we find these in Africa and then really all around the world. Um, now, the, uh, the first kind of miniature sculptures that have ever been discovered um, primarily come from this Org nation period, which is basically South and Central Europe, um, but it does extend, you know, all the way to like probably present day Russia, Turkey, and some areas in the Middle East. <clears throat> Okay, now this is what these little figurines would have looked like. Um, the oldest example we have on the left is called Lovenmensch, which is German for lion man. So it looks, you know, like a human um, body with a lion's head. Um, so that's, which is interesting because this is something that we also eventually would, you know, see in, in, in ancient Egypt, but this is many, many years before that. Um, and then another common um, form that we will see is called, they're called Venus figures. Okay, and they are usually um, female bodies. Lots of times their curves are very accentuated. They're thought to encourage, um, you know, fertility. Uh, this would have been a huge concern for human at the time for, you know, women to survive childbirth and for, you know, children to keep being born successfully and things like that. Um, so uh, it's, you know, thought that these could have been held as good luck. Figurines are used in some kind of maybe religious, um, you know, rituals and things like that. Um, and then another um, early thing that we find is a musical instrument. This was also found in Germany. It's a flute. Um, it's estimated to be between 35 and 40,000 years old. Um, but it does seem that often when art begins to flirt or, you know, emerge in a society, so do other art forms, it, you know, in including music. Okay, now most of these figurines, these Venus figures, the Lion Man, were actually carved from woolly mammoth ivory. Um, because remember, this is so long ago that Europe was in an ice age. Um, and so we had completely different creatures that were living and roaming the earth. 
Um, this is a, this picture on the right is a actual real woolly mammoth tusks to give you an idea of just how enormous that would have been. Um, the figurines themselves were very small, sometimes only a couple um, uh, centimeters. So I would imagine one tusk would have allowed them to form a number of things. <clears throat> okay. Um, now, uh, like I said, these um, these Venus figurines, uh, these are all from different parts of Europe. Um, they were suspected to symbolize, you know, fertility. Um, but the name Venus is actually kind of a modern term that we've sort of put on these older figures. But um, Venus was the Roman goddess of love. Um, the Romans had, you know, traveled all through Europe and things like that and had a big impact on Europe. So it's not a, a surprise that they would use the term Venus to describe them. But again, it's a modern name applied to older figures. Um, and again, it was, um, they were sort of, uh, what, you know, what we might call hypersexualized. Um, I mean, they were female figures and, you know, the breasts and the hips and the rear ends were accentuated um, because, again, this would have been a huge concern for societies at the time to have um, women that were successfully, you know, carrying babies and surviving childbirth. Okay, so um, like I said, when we, um, when we find these examples of art and we also find examples of musical instruments, um, we don't know this for sure, but generally this also indicates um, the emergence of religious beliefs and rituals. Um, very usually um, when you th see these things coincided, it's not necessarily that the culture was trying to make art just for art's sake and make beautiful walls and things like that, but lots of times they were performing ceremonies um, to perhaps ensure a bountiful harvest, a good hunting um, you know, season, things like that. Um, and so uh, it, we don't always know this, but speculations are often that these were used in religious rituals. Um, so, the earliest human paintings ever discovered on walls are thought to be approximately 40,000 years old, um, but they almost always are hand stencils. Um, and the oldest ones, you know, uh, at this point that are, you know, generally agreed upon um, are in uh, Indonesia on an island called Sulawesi. But we actually see examples of these hand um, imprints, um, sort of stamps, or the negatives of a hand print, so the paint is all kind of um, sprayed sort of around the hand. We see examples of it in South Africa, Argentina, um, Europe, and things like that. So um, it, it is not something that was just specific to this region. Um, so we have a couple theories about how this paint was put on there. Um, there's both examples of positives and negatives of these hands. So a positive would be if somebody stuck their hand directly in a pig pigment or paint and just stamped it on the wall. The negative, which is actually the thing we see more examples of, would have been if someone spray, you know, kind of sprayed paint around it. And there's two theories that people actually put the pigment in their mouth and kind of just spit it out and blew it directly onto the wall, or that they created some kind of hollow tube or used some kind of hollow tube, put the pigment in there, and then kind of blew it around the hand. Um, and we see examples of men's hands, women's hands, children's hands, um, all of the above. They're almost always a kind of an ochre color, which is a, a ochre, which is sort of a brownish red. Um, you know, we, there's just lots of reddish clay around the world that's very iron rich that makes it reddish. Um, but sometimes we see charcoal also. Charcoal is simply burnt wood, um, and so it's a very easy pigment to create. So black and brown, probably the earliest pigments that were easy to create and that also last a long time. Um, so like I said, these hand stencils can be found everywhere, Australia, Argentina, Europe, um, and whenever we find uh, an art form, such as like basket weaving or something that really occurs everywhere in the world, that means that it most likely had its origins in Africa. Um, that if a tradition has been carried to the, every far end of the continent, that it probably started in Africa and then just simply got continued um, as, peop as people spread around the world. Um, so now this was a common practice for maybe 10 or 20,000 years and then it sort of fell out of practice. So it's sort of interesting that we can find lots of these at a certain period and then it sort of kind of went out of fashion, but not just in one continent, in many continents. Now, the earliest figurative paintings that we find are, and figurative means it has a figure in it, like a human figure or an animal figure. And it appears that humans were more interested in drawing animals than people, um, pro probably for hunting purposes and things like that. Um, but the earliest examples that we find are 32,000 um, years BP, which BP means before present. Lots of times we see um, BC before Christ. Again, that's a Eurocentric timeline. It's becoming more, um, you know, politically correct to use different timelines that are more, uh, you know, representative of numerous cultures. Um, but anyway, um, but the, the earliest figurative um, ones that we found are in southern France in Chauvet, 
punk dark. So I'll talk about that um, cave a little bit. Um, but anyway, it, they, they, they figured out these ages using a radiocarbon method. Okay, now again, I'm gonna play a little bit of this YouTube video, um, Instant Egghead or, or is the person that deserves credit for this. Um, but, uh, and it explains a little bit how, actually, I, uh, yeah, I'll play just a little bit of it. <clears throat> but it does a good job explaining how we use radiocarbon dating to age things. How do we know how old something is? For people, we'd ask to see their birth certificate. For trees, we'd count the rings. But how do we know how old a fossil is? Fossils have their own internal clock. Scientists can read it by looking at the ratio of two different types of carbon atoms. Of course, every living thing is made of carbon. Plants grab carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and use it to form complex organic molecules. Animals get their carbon by eating these plants. But there's more than one form of carbon. Most carbon atoms have six protons and six neutrons. We call this carbon-12. High up in the atmosphere, sometimes cosmic rays hit nitrogen atoms. This creates carbon with six protons and eight neutrons. We call this carbon-14. Carbon-12 and carbon-14 behave alike, but carbon-14 has one unique and important attribute. It's unstable. So once an animal dies, the carbon-14 in its body will start to go away. Every 5,730 years on average, about half of the carbon-14 atoms will decay into nitrogen. This is its half-life. After one half-life, the animal will have about half the amount of carbon-14 it started with. After another half-life, it will have about a quarter. And after another half-life, it will have about an eighth. By contrast... Okay, so we're going to stop there because I'm not a scientist and I don't want to mislead or anything. Um, but basically, these two types of carbons exist in any living um, you know, plant or animal. And lots of times, the pigments that artists used in prehistoric times came from plants. Um, uh, you know, they were, they maybe crushed up berries to create colors and things like that. Um, and because they were living things, you know, in the, in the pigments, um, lots of times they can compare this, those two types of carbon, um, and, you know, figure out the ratio of carbon 12 to carbon 14 and get a pretty good guesstimate about, you know, when the paint was made itself. Okay. So, um, anyway, the, the paintings that we see in these caves, um, primarily in Europe, usually feature animals that are now extinct. Um, and they look like they were either animals that would have been hunted or possibly would have been animals that were actually predators and that killed humans and that they would have been afraid of. Um, so we see lions, panthers, bears, hyenas, boars, woolly rhinoses, um, bison, deer, ibex. Those are kind of look like goats with big long horns that go back like that. Um, and occasionally we do see some natural features like volcanoes. Um, but it looks to be things that humans were generally afraid of. Okay. Um, and this is just another graphic that shows some of the animals that would have been around in Europe um, during these times, because remember, it would have been an ice age. So there's a ground sloth, woolly rhinoceroses, a saber-toothed squirrel, saber-toothed tiger. Um, anyway, um, tarpon, which w was some type of early horse. Um, there's mastodons, wisnets, things that I haven't heard, but even looks to be like something like an early kangaroo. Um, so anyway, some interesting things that we've also discovered in some of these caves uh, but there is a fossilized set of children's footprints um, right next to um, some the fossilized sets of wolf paw prints. Um, and this suggests, because there's a the, the certain cave that they found this in, it went way back into the cave, um, and the wolf was right beside the, the little boy, presumably the entire walk in the cave. Um, it suggests that human beings were domesticating animals back then, and that um, you know wolves, dogs, things like that actually would have been loyal to human beings. Um, you know, even 30, 30, 40,000 years ago, which is pretty exciting. Okay, so um, so what did they do to do this? That does appear that they actually scraped the walls clean um, before they would actually paint. Um, lots of times it looked like they would incorporate protrusions in the rock, so they didn't have a flat surface to work on. If there was a little bump, they might make that the head, they might make that the belly of a creature or something like that, um, and actually help it to appear like it was actually a three-dimensional object. Um, they would also definitely not just illustrate, you know, an animal from the side, but really tell stories. Um, some of the scenes um, in these, uh, you know, show rhinos butting horns and fighting, looking like as if they're competing for territory or mating rights or something like that. So um, the stories are kind of clear, and that's what I'm talking about is right there. 
Okay, now um, another famous cave that um, just really got known about in the 90s is known as the Koske Cave. It's named after a man's last name was Koske that discovered it. Um, but anyway, this uh, was very interesting. Um, it was actually found 100 feet below sea level. Um, he was a scuba diver um, and he had gone, you know, very deep into a cave and then come up and he found what looked to be like kind of like a zebra paintings on the wall. Um, so uh, this is just absolutely fascinating for a number of reasons. Um, for one, we all know that zebras are from Africa, but this is in France. Um, so this shows that during the Ice Age, um, you know, these early horses and things like that that probably originated in Africa um, possibly still resembled zebras more, even though they were up in Europe. So that's super fascinating. Um, now, it, the reason this cave had actually been discovered um, possibly before Koske, um, but it really didn't gain notoriety until the 90s um, because that, or I'm sorry, it was discovered by Koske, but it, um, it was kind of quickly hidden from the public. Um, they shut it off and they didn't really want anybody to damage it. Um, uh, and they didn't, you know, because it wasn't easy to access. And it was, you know, a few people knew about it and three divers um, wanted to go explore it. And unfortunately, they died um, in the process. Um, and there's a number of reasons. For one, it's completely dark. That entire trench under the sea is dark. It's super long. Um, it was, you know, scuba gear. It wasn't e easy to stay underwater that long. But also, it's suspected that when the divers um, came into this region of the cave that it was not oxygen rich. Um, there's no plants in there. It's been sealed off for a long time. There could have been toxic gases. They think that the um, divers possibly inhaled some toxic gases, which made them kind of lose their orientation, um, and they were not able to make it back out of the cave. So nowadays, when people do scuba dive down there, you can see there's a cord right here, but they tether the scuba diver to a boat, submarine type situation, and that way they can kind of pull them back so they, they, so they don't get lost or nothing tragic happens um, when they do that. Okay, so just going to play a few seconds of this. This is just a little video footage of what it looked like um, in the 90s when it was sort of rediscovered. A French underwater explorer has found the most spectacular prehistoric art gallery since the discovery of the now world-famous Lascaux cave paintings 50 years ago. Although the only entrance to the newly discovered cave is 120... Gives you an idea of how dark it was down there. ...containing the 14,000-year-old art treasure is just above sea level. After swimming 400 feet along previously unexplored underwater passageways, the diver, Frenchman Henri Cosquet, found the cavern walls covered by paintings and engravings of bison, horses, red deer, ibex, and creatures that look like penguins, but are more likely to be the now extinct great orc. A French underwater Sorry. explorer has found the most spectacular there we go. So um, really interesting. It gives us a glimpse into some of the animals that were alive back then as well. So there's actually only one prehistoric cave like this open um, to the public and it's in France. Um, and it's called, I might be pronouncing this, Peck Merle, Merle probably. Um, anyway, it's one of the simpler caves, but it is open to the public. But unfortunately, um, because when the public can go inside and they breathe on it or touch it, um, the carbon di dioxide that we exhale um, allows mold to grow. Mold, you know, plants love carbon dioxide that we breathe out, and the mold causes deterioration and causes the paint to flake away, fade, and things like that. Um, and so, really, um, you know, most of the well preserved um, cave art is really due to some type of tragedy a volcanic explosion, a rock slide, something like that. So, um, the Lascaux caves are, in many cases, one of the most famous sets of. Um, of you know parietal art that still exists um, it's really because it's so well preserved um, it's really modern in comparison to some of the other things we've been talking about it's only about 17,000 years old that's still a really long time ago um, but uh, they have over 6,000 really well preserved images um, and uh, originally this was open to the public um, but they noticed that again the carbon dioxide breathing um, was deteriorating the, the work so they've closed it off to the public but they're actually recreating kind of like a fake version um, for the public. Um, so uh, faux is the word for false in French and let's go. So it's kind of a joke, the faux, let's go. Um, but this is actually the fake version that is um, that is some, is that has been created and is finished in some places and they're adding to it, but they're literally making caves the exact same shape 
um, as, the, as the originals. They have artists coming in that are recreating the images the best they possibly can. Um, and this is a, a huge tourist attraction. Um, you know, it's something akin to like, well, you know, Disney World or something that we would have in the United States. It's very, it's costing them a lot of money to make it, but they're also profiting a lot off of it. Now, um, actually, the Altamira Cave in Spain, which is this, again, not very far from the locations that, of the Lascaux Cave in France in the big scheme of things, has um, kind of the largest ceiling chambers um, and the most complex murals uh, found to the date. Um, so this is actually a little bit older than um, the, the work found in France, and they, it, it looks as though um, humans have been drawing on the same cave walls for a period of over 20,000 years. So when they carbon dated the paintings, they would find some paintings that were very recent um, and some that were, you know, much older. Um, and what's really interesting about these is that a, a lot of cave paintings we've seen around the world are uh, kind of like some of the images are simple and symbolic. Um, but here, the artists were create, had shading, had three-dimensional volume, had texture. Um, you know, it's, it's clear that they had a very sophisticated drawing skills. Um, so this has been nicknamed the Sistine Chapel of Paleolithic art because the Sistine Chapel is still the kind of most complex ceiling that's ever been painted in the world. Um, so uh, the picture on the left up here is what it looks like if you're actually inside. Again, you can't see all, the whole ceiling at one time because it's so, so big. These are very big, bigger than humans. Um, so this is a drawing that sort of shows what the, if, if you could look at it, a piece of paper, what it would look like. Okay, so, and this is the real Sistine Chapel, just so you can kind of get what, why people call it that. Um, the Sistine Chapel was painted by Michelangelo. It took him approximately four years to paint this. Um, it's in the Vatican um, in Rome, Italy. So this is, uh, this is where, um, you know, our popes get selected. Um, the kind of the 200 most important members of the Catholic Church meet in this room. Um, and whenever a pope retires or passes away um, to pick the, the newest pope, um, you can actually visit it. I went there a couple years ago with my daughter, Emma. We, I actually lost her. She was only 10 years old. And this, this has been, in this picture, it's been set up for a wedding. But normally, these, these areas are actually uncovered, which are more paintings. Um, and then this area is just wall-to-wall -wall people, just packed. Um, and no one's allowed to talk. They whisper. Um, and then, you know, lots of people go with tour guides. So there's all sorts of people with, like, umbrellas trying to lead their group. And Emma walked away from our group, our umbrella, and followed another lady with another umbrella, but we found her. But it was kind of scary because I couldn't talk to anybody and tell anybody my daughter was lost. So um, anyway, but just a really amazing achievement. Um, so, you know, I can tell you lots of other funny things. Originally, Michelangelo painted everybody nude on the ceiling and people were kind of offended by it. So they had another artist come in and, bl and paint blankets all over, um, every, all the nude body parts and things like that. And they, they have a kind of nickname for the the blanket painter in Italy, and I can't remember what it is. But anyway, um, so due to the impressive quality of these Altamira caves in Spain, um, scientists in France were very skeptical to accept that it was valid. Um, the, in fact, Marcelino Sautola is the, is the man that he and his daughter were exploring, and they're the ones that discovered it. Actually, really his eight-year-old daughter is the one that, explore, uh, that discovered it um, and that showed it to him. And um, people teased him and, you know, they were like, he, he completely forged it because they thought the paintings were too good, too detailed, too three-dimensional compared to anything they had seen before. Um, they didn't believe him. And I also think there was a little competi um, competitiveness there. Um, you know, the French are just known for being an artistic culture that supports art. And they've, they have, uh, you know, so many of the world's greatest art forms. Um, and I think they were, you know, possibly a little bit envious that Spain might have something that kind of outshined um, any of the, the things that they had. Um, so, again, I'm going to just play a few seconds of it, but there's actually a film called Finding Altamira. Um, Antonio Banderas plays Marcelino um, Sautola, and it just, you know, is a, it's a fiction version, but it does, it's based on the true story of him discovering these caves. So, and you can see in the movie, it kind of uh, explores the fact that this was 
very controversial for the Catholic Church because it had really um, gone in contrast to the things that, that, that they had been teaching. Um, so unfortunately, um, he, he was ridiculed his entire lifetime, um, you know, and, uh, you know, actually accused of, of, of lying and things like that. And 14 years after Sautalas, um passed away, the French Scientific uh, Society substantiated all of his claims. Um, they issued an apology and they restored both his and his daughter's reputation. And at least his daughter, who actually was the true discoverer um, of it, did she did leave to, she did live to see um, her family, um, you know, his his reputation restored um, and their respect earned from the public. All right, that's it. Thank you very much.